Can you hear me? There we go. Good evening. Good to see you. Glad you're here. Um, this is, uh, we're going to just jump right into the documentary uh, that we left off a couple weeks ago. We're going to just jump right into the same exact place. Um, this is a documentary, Unrelenting Love. It examines the, um, what happens after we die. And the whole concept that I have been sharing with you about um, the victorious gospel and in the end that it reaches all, um, that's what this documentary does. It explores that issue. It, it's laid out all three of them, but it is in favor of the victorious gospel. That, and and I, what I love about this is that this is just picking up steam. And it's uh, going through churches and such. So what we'll do, we'll just watch a few minutes of it. Uh, we'll bring the house lights down just a little bit. I'm going to pray. We'll bring the house lights down. And then we will uh, jump in the video. We'll have a few minutes afterwards. So if you have a question or so, write it down. If you don't have any paper, remember it. Write it on your hands. <laughs> Those are a couple of your options. Uh, I commend you for coming out and looking at this. A lot of individuals, uh, particularly those of you who have been raised in church or part of church for a long time, m most won't do it. Most refuse to even examine this. And uh, so we're going to jump in. Um, let me pray. Father, for your goodness um, and your grace and your love, your mercy that endures forever, we thank you. I pray that our hearts and minds would be open not just for information but for transformation so that we would grow deeper in understanding who we are in you, uh, your great love for us and that it would inspire us, give us hope, fill us with joy and just encourage us and inspire us to share your love with as many as we can. We pray in Jesus' name, amen. Go. What are you thinking? You enjoying this? It's a lot of information, isn't there? I the last part I find so. Um, wow, there's a lot of this. <laughs> I'm making notes. I love the idea of the mission in Japan. Uh, that that this was brought by individuals who believed in universalism. And they built churches, and those churches still exist today. Yet, you'll be accused of how do you evangelize if there's not the threat of hell. Well, there you go. This, this happens, but again, most people don't know this information. And so one of the reasons I enjoyed bringing this to you is that we've explored it here. And sometimes you get the feeling that you're the only one, but you're not. This is a message that has been part of Christian history and uh, I like what Robin Perry, who's my favorite, and all that, that the author of the Evangelical Universalist, um, that throughout church history, if you study church history, this, this idea of universalism after, David Bentley Hart is brilliant. The problem is you can't, I can't understand him. It's like three, two, three or four words into it, and he just starts getting more lofty with his ideas. He's a brilliant individual. But, um, uh, you know, whenever the, the church was married to Rome. The, the church was never married to an empire. It was just existed and then it became connected to Rome and from that point on, significant changes happened. Uh, significant changes. And you can read about this. It's all there. It's online. You can read about what, what has transpired. And... Um, um, but universalism then began to be pushed down, but it always it just keeps cropping up. It just doesn't die because individuals began to look at Scripture, not because individuals are like, well, I'm just too. It's it's all based on emotion. No, it's looking at Scripture and using reason and experience and tradition and Scripture and coming to that conclusion. So, enough said for me. Uh, I've got tons of notes here. I could. So I, I, there's some, some brilliant things that were said uh, in that but um, really right now we'll just take a, co a couple of questions 
Okay, so is there something that was stated that you go, I have a question about? Uh, we don't have time for long comments, but if you have a question, uh, that would be great. Anybody? Or is everybody just doing wonderful? There's a lot of information. How about, like, can I just give, can I toss out, uh, um, it? Hold on, we'll have to get you a microphone. Well, they, they have to hear it online, Ed, so they'll need the microphone. So your question. Well, the, the, in my understanding then, the crucifix re represents two things. It, it represents justice, Jesus serving justice for our sins, and Jesus' immense love for us. So it, it basically the crucifixion represents justice and love. Does that make sense? Yes. Yes. He certainly, if by justice, he did suffer our death. Yes. If by justice you mean he experienced the anger and of, of an angry retributive God, I don't believe that. And certainly it stands for, for love, for sure. Well, the word justice is essential for peace and freedom um, and that's what God wants for us that's why certainly I also yes that I way. agree I say I agree with you as long as we define what we're saying by the word justice you see because this would be a great study sometime is to study the word justice in scripture because we have a western mindset when it comes to justice when we hear justice we think of a judge handing down a sentence and we think that, that, that somehow that brings justice. It doesn't. I've ministered to many people who have been victims of crime. And yes, when somebody has to pay for that crime, there is a sense. But if you've lost a loved one, it does not satisfy because you still have lost a loved one. Mercy, justice in Scripture. The Bible talks about let justice flow. You want to know what it is? It's reaching the oppressed. It's bringing healing. That's what justice is. And the problem is, we as human beings are limited. I'm thrilled, thankful, grateful. We are blessed to live in a land that seeks to bring justice. But human beings can't do it. Not completely. But he does want us to be workers of justice. But seeking justice is from a scriptural standpoint, is to seek restoration. Not just punishment, so somebody pays. How does somebody get better? How does, how does somebody experience healing? That is the gospel. That's uh, what is uh, justice. So, yes, justice happened on the cross because God is des desiring to bring healing to us all. So God looks upon us and says one of two things, class. You, you tell me what it says, what God says. God looks at us and goes, those are wicked, evil, awful, repugnant, whatever words I can come up with, I can use the language of, of uh, Calvin and the language of Jonathan Edwards and say that you're nothing but snow-covered dung. Okay, is that what God sees when he looks at us? Or does he see people who are sick? Does he see people who need healing? Does he see people who've been deceived? Does he see people who need to be rescued? Does he see people who need to be kidnapped? Does he see people who, who somebody needs to go in and bind the strong man and plunder his goods? That's scriptural language if you're not. That's what Jesus says. Somebody has to bind the strong man and go in and plunder the goods and take back what belongs to him. That is what is meant by justice, if that makes sense. Anybody else? That, by the way, I'm just telling you, 
I, I'm, I liked what I heard in some of you going, Pastor Fred, you're not letting us ask questions. Raise your hand and I'll stop. But as I don't see hands, I'm, I'm uh, talk for a couple more minutes. Um, uh, I forgot what I was going to say. This is what happens when you get old. It just, this is just really bad. This is really bad. I've got to say it right when I'm thinking it or I'm done. It's just not going to come. It might, it, here's when it will come back. Two o'clock in the morning, I'll sit up and go, that's what I was going to say. And Laura's not going to care at that time. So, uh, all right, any other uh, uh, questions? One, one thing real quick um, as you're seeking to maybe raise your hand. Anybody, anybody else? Just, just for the sake of reasoning, let's use our minds. Love the Lord your God with all your heart, soul, and mind. So let's worship God with our minds for a minute. There's no mention of eternal conscious torment in the Old Testament. So for, as the one individual says, God is not going to talk about this for 6,000 years? Does that make sense to you? Does, it, does anybody look at this and go, wait a minute. In, in my conversations, I've said it many times to other pastors that allow me to have the conversation. Most just go heretic. But outside of that, when I am allowed to have a conversation, I ask, why isn't it mentioned? And then here's another one. Would you please read the messages in the book of Acts after the resurrection and show me one time where one of them talked about hell? Wouldn't you think the first preachers of the gospel, the first ones that are going to go out and preach, they're going to say, you better believe this, you better raise your hand and pray the prayer, or this is what's going to happen to you. But they didn't. Interesting, isn't it? And one individual said, you can't find it in Paul. David Bentley Hart, and he says it's a slam dunk. Every scholar knows, but that's his way of... That Paul never talked about it. You say, yeah, First Thessalonians. Okay, we'll talk about that passage sometime. It talks about eternal destruction, but we've looked at those words here in the last few, you know, several weeks. But Paul doesn't talk about it. Does that not, does that not cause somebody to go, wait a minute. Never in any of them does he talk about it? And then, I love it when people go, yeah, but Pastor Fred, Jesus spoke more about hell than he did heaven. Please look at me and listen. That's not true. Because the kingdom of heaven and the kingdom of God is what Jesus is talking about. And the scripture has tons more information about the kingdom of God and the kingdom of heaven than it does about future judgment. Um, anybody else? Anything? I mean, I've got tons of stuff I wrote down here. I, how many of you think this? For me, it makes sense. I, I, I'm just asking you. Intuitively, if you if just take your training out, let's just think about it. Intuitively, eternal conscious torment doesn't make sense. Intuitively, God torturing people forever doesn't make any sense. You have to force it to make it fit into scripture you have to force it to make it fit with jesus and we have to build this theology of god being one way and jesus being another way in order to make it fit it doesn't fit um all right anything else i'm gonna go out five minutes early all right jack one more question in the back jack in the back not Jack in the Box, Jack in the Back. It's just a comment. I was wondering when we were going to change our name to the First Universalist Church. Of uh, no, I've been accused of that. <laughs> Thank you, Jack. What, what, um, you know, to be honest with you, um, there are two words that, that are difficult to explain. Universalist is very difficult to explain because of Unitarianism. So Unitarianism is that all roads lead to God. Doesn't matter what you believe. You know, it doesn't matter. And so if you go into a Unitarian church, you're not going to hear Jesus, you're not going to hear the Bible, you're not going to hear anything. It's just going to be, doesn't matter. 
the universalism that is per portrayed on this is salvation. There is no other name given among, under heaven, given among men, whereby we must be saved. It is the name Jesus. Universalism teaches the only one way of our deliverance, and it's through the love and sacrifice and gift of Jesus Christ. That's an evangel that's, that, I, I, that's evangelical talk right there. Now, so no, that's not going to happen. And then number two, um, I, I'm frustrated right now with the term evangelical, personally. I just, I find great frustration in what is named in the name of evangelicalism today. It just, a lot, but that's a whole other topic. <laughs> All right. Uh, if you could, oh, you know what? Next week is the first Wednesday of the month, isn't it? I messed up last week by getting uh, nauseous and not being able to be here. Um, so next week, we've we've tried to say that this is probably the first one we've ever taken off, if it's true. The first Wednesday of the month is the Sabbath one, so we won't meet next Wednesday, but the following we will. So, sound good? No? Uh, we, you can come, Alicia, and, and just be here. No, we, we will not meet next Wednesday, but we'll start back up. And what we'll do when we, we go through May, we'll finish this up. I'm going to close it and wrap all of this up with going through some objections, and then we're going to tie a bow on it, and we're going to set it aside. Okay? I'm going to set it aside, and I've got lots of other topics that I think will greatly interest you on Wednesday night. And uh, Wrath of God is one of them. By the way, I thought that was outstanding. Steve McVeigh's explaining the wrath of God. I mean, you know, you get accused of not believing in a lot of things, but yes, if I believe in the wrath of God. It's just the understanding of what it means. Absolutely. So, all right, I'm going to pray and dismiss. Father, uh, our time tonight has been valuable. I hope each person here feels encouraged to know how deeply loved they are and that you will not give up on us. Even those who fall to the depths of evil and darkness, you continue to pursue with your love. What an incredible gospel this is. And I pray, Father, that you would help us as a church know how to share this, know how to make known our understanding so that we can reach out to those who may be disillusioned and hurt within the church systems but also those who have never really even given church a thought because of these ideas so give us wisdom to know how to share this message dismiss us in your love pray in Jesus name amen thank you so much for coming everybody